Good evening. My name is Peter Brown. I am the duly elected chair of the Associates of the Boston Public Library, and I'm delighted to welcome you here this evening for our 100 year retroactive book award. Uh, for those of you who have attended in the past, you'll know that this is an election, but I promise you this will be one that will be less stressful and more fun than the other election that's going on um, this evening. So first, a little background. Uh, the Associates of the Boston Public Library is not a division of the library. We are an independent, not-for-profit organization, but it's our mission to preserve and promote the um, astounding treasure trove of items in the BPL's special collections. Uh, these collections um, comprise hundreds of thousands of manuscripts, works of art, photographs, historical artifacts, uh, ranging from a Shakespeare first folio to uh, probably the preeminent collection of anti-slavery materials anywhere in the United States including letters and, and writings from abolitionists, such as William Lloyd Garrison, Frederick Douglass, Sojourner Truth. And the collection includes the personal library of John Adams, um, incredible stunning prints by Toulouse-Lautrec and M.C. Escher, uh, probably a million photographs that document uh, the evolution of, of Boston and our country. Um, it's an astounding collection, and we are very proud of the associates to play a small part uh, in the preservation uh, of these items and also um, making them uh, available online to the broadest public possible. Uh, the BPL is truly a national and worldwide treasure. Uh, this program uh, annually takes a look back at um, what literature was most popular a century ago and ask the question, is it relevant today? And 1920 was a banner year for literature. And you'll, you'll hear more about that in a minute. It was also a remarkable year for the news. And 1920, of course, was the first year of the Roaring Twenties. Um, and it was the year in which the Treaty of Versailles was signed, officially ending World War I. Uh, it was the year in which the uh, League of Nations was established. Uh, 1920 uh, was the year uh, that saw the establishment of two constitutional amendments. The 19th, I hope we'll all know about, which was the amendment that gave uh, women, or most women anyhow, uh, the right to vote. Um, but it also saw uh, the, the enactment of the 18th Amendment, which was the notorious prohibition law. Uh, 1920 saw the very first uh, game played in uh, baseball's Negro Leagues. Uh, there was a terrorist attack uh, in New York City carried out when a horse-drawn carriage uh, loaded with explosives uh, was detonated on Wall Street uh, right around the J.P. Morgan building and it killed 38 people and uh, injured many hundreds of people. And it was the year in which the Spanish flu finally came to an end, a worldwide pandemic that killed anywhere um, in the range of 17 to 50 million people. So there were events uh, that are eerily familiar um, to those events of our time today. So to introduce you to the literature of 1920 and tell you a little bit more about our culture at the start of the Roaring Twenties, it's a great privilege for me to present our moderator, someone who needs no introduction at all, and that's Christopher Lydon who was host of WBUR's Radio Open Source. Uh, in the 1970s, he brilliantly covered politics for the New York Times from their Washington Bureau. Uh, throughout the 1980s, he was familiar to everyone in the Boston area as the host of the 10 o'clock news on WGBH-TV. From there, he co-founded The Connection on WBUR, and he's continued in that medium since with Radio Open Source. Uh, he's also the host of Open Source with Christopher Lydon, which is the world's longest running podcast, which is extraordinary. The associates of the BPL is so proud to call him a longtime friend, and I'm delighted uh, to turn the evening over uh, to Chris. Take it away, Chris. 1920 
2020 was, after all, the year of Sinclair Lewis's Main Street, Scott Fitzgerald's The Other Side of Paradise, also Hugh Lofting's Dr. Doolittle, my father's favorite book to read to us kids, Agatha, Agatha Christie's first Hercule Poirot, two new volumes, I believe, by from Proust in that series, at least one from Galsworthy in his Foresight serial, not to mention L. Frank Baum, L. Frank Baum published one of his many Oz books. Mm -hmm. We narrowed our race, the best of 100 years ago, to three remarkable books, three remarkable presenters. The books are what was originally a play that introduced the word robot and the inner lives, outer lives, every life of robots. It was called R.U.R. by Carol Chapik, a great leap forward in science fiction to be advocated by the humanist, physicist, and decorated writer, Alan Lightman of MIT. Then it will be the first of W.E.B. Du Bois's three autobiographical books, landmarks, all of them on race and discrimination in America. The book is called Dark Water, Voices from Within the Veil, to be advocated by the historian Chad Williams of Brandeis. And third, the novel that won the Pulitzer Prize for fiction a year later for Edith Wharton, The Age of Innocence, from Edith Wharton's own estate in the Berkshires, The Mount, in Lenox, Massachusetts. Susan Whistler has come to Miss Wharton's rescue and ours in filling in for our friend Jackie Mitchard, who would have made the case for Edith Wharton, but she took ill, alas, and could not join the battle this evening. Alan Lightman, please lead the way with R.U.R. by Carol Chapek. And thank you for joining us, Alan. Thank you, Chris. Uh, it's a delight to be here. I, I did this event a few years ago with a book by Albert Einstein. Uh, Carol Chapek's play, and it is a play, R.U.R., and that stands for Rossum's Universal Robots, is about an engineer named Rossum who develops a synthetic material out of which to make artificial people. And he calls them robots, uh, although these artificial beings are, are not mechanical, they're made of synthetic flesh and blood. They look exactly like regular people, except that they have no emotions and they can't reproduce on their own. Uh, the robots uh, represent cheap labor. Uh, they're mass produced in factories and assembly lines. And I just wanted to remind you that in 1920, the first assembly line had just been introduced uh, a few years earlier by our, by our own Henry Ford. The, the vision of the creators in RUR is that with thousands of robots, humans will no longer need to work. There will be an abundance of everything. Poverty will be eliminated. People will be wealthy. The director of the factory says, robots are not people. They have no souls. God has no grasp of modern technology, end quote. A young woman visits the robot factory and is horrified that the robots have no feelings. She says to the director, what you're doing is abominable, end quote. She wants to liberate the robots but the director and his human colleagues say that the robots don't need liberating because they have no emotions and no desires. Eventually, the robots rebel against the human race. One of the robots says, we wanna be like people. You have to kill and rule to be like people, end quote. So the robots kill every human being on earth except for one person, Alquist, the chief engineer, and they like him because he can make things. At the end of the play, two robots, a male and a female, miraculously discover that they have developed, developed feelings. In fact, they fall in love with each other. The one remaining human, Alquist, is cheered by this development and feels that life will continue. The author of this play, Karel Chapek, was born in 1890 in a small town in what is now Czechoslovakia. For RUR and other works, 
He was nominated for the Nobel Prize in Literature seven times, but, but never won. Chopik was deeply influenced by a number of factors, specifically the horrors of World War I, the terrors of modern technology, and Mary Shelley's famous novel, Frankenstein. RUR has had dozens of performances all over the world, and as Chris said, is regarded as the first science fiction theater and responsible, was responsible for inventing the word robot. The play initiated a lot of debates among intellectuals about what it means to be human. Just like H.G. Wells' earlier novel did, The Island of Dr. Moreau, in which a scientist goes to an island just as Chapek's engineer and creates beasts who are half human and half animal. In an article that Chapek wrote for the Saturday Review in 1923, he said that the engineer of his play, Rossum, is inspired by a foolish and obstinate wish to prove God unnecessary and meaningless. A product of the human brain, Chapek wrote, has at last escaped from the control of human hands. Such a statement echoes the, world, the words of our own Henry David Thoreau and Walden when Thoreau wrote, we do not ride the railroad, the railroad rides us. I, I love that comment. <laughs> and it is a warning to us today as we race about in our time-driven, wired existence, always trying to keep up with the most up-to-date technology, not taking the time to ask ourselves, who are we, what do we believe in, and where are we going? Mm. Thanks, Chris. Quick question, Alan. Uh, why does this, your summary, and it's a book that's brand new to me, but why does it remind me so much of Brave New World, Aldous Huxley, in which it's not robots, but it's roboticized people and reproduction and tyranny and drug use to, you know, to dehumanize all of us, et cetera? Well, it certainly reminds me of that. Uh, but uh, I was I thought of of H. G. Wells' book because in both cases you have uh, beings who are who are part human and part not human, and I think that that's what we have coming for us in the future, when in the next fifty years we'll probably have computer chips planted in our brains that connect us directly to the internet. Being hashed at MIT as we speak, right? Right. We more techno than bio. Right. Uh, thank you. That's a strong, strong case for an interesting book, Alan. Uh, next uh, comes Chad Williams. And let me just say his big book, a landmark among Amer American historians, is titled Torchbearers of Democracy African American Soldiers in the World War I era. Thank you, Chad Williams, for joining us. Thank you very much, Chris. It's a great pleasure to be with everyone this evening. Uh, and uh, the book I'm going to be uh, discussing comes directly out of the World War I era, uh, and I think is particularly relevant uh, today, uh, of all days, uh, because W.E.B. Du Bois warned us. Through our mental and emotional exhaustion, I'm sure we're all still trying to process the events of, of last night, the still uncertain outcome of a historical election. And many people, myself included, are asking, why was it so close? Why is it so close? How could nearly half the electorate vote for racism, sexism, authoritarianism, anti-intellectualism, incompetence, moral mendacity. Du Bois warned us. A century ago, Du Bois warned us. He warned us in his 1920 book, Dark Water, Voices from the Veil. Du Bois, the most preeminent black scholar activist of his day was astonishingly prolific, authoring over the course of his 95 years of life uh, he died in Ghana on the eve of the March on Washington in 1963, 
um, authored 22 books in a variety of genres, the most famous being his 1903 classic, The Souls of Black Folk. Dark Water, I would argue, stands as one of the most important books of his corpus. Crafted as a sequel of sorts to The Souls of Black Folk, Dark Water is a similarly experimental text combining poetry, short story fiction, memoir, and pieces of previously published essays. It is a book seeped in both rage and hope that exhibited the full range of Du Bois's remarkable intellectual, political, and artistic gifts. The context of the book is everything. Du Bois wrote and revised Darkwater over a momentous two-year period, 1918 and 1919, spanning America's participation in the First World War, passage of the 19th Amendment, the emergence of the New Negro Movement, the beginnings of the Harlem Renaissance, the growth of Pan-Africanism, and the horrific racial violence of the Red Summer of 1919. Through the book's 10 chapters and accompanying interludes, Du Bois explores the condition of being Black in relation to issues such as colonialism and empire, class and economic inequality, women's rights and universal suffrage, labor and education, that reflected how much the world and Black folk along with it had changed from when he wrote Souls of Black Oak in 1903 to when he publishes Darkwater. Above all else, Darkwater is a book about the relationship between race and democracy. Du Bois takes his readers behind the veil. It's a very powerful metaphor of the veil, symbolizing the color line, to vividly articulate the meaning of being black and the terrible costs of white supremacy. He writes, and I quote, we know in America how to discourage choke and murder ability when it go when it's so far forget um excuse me um let me repeat that uh, we know in America how to discourage choke and murder ability when it so far forgets itself as to choose a dark skin. Also from his as he described it, veiled corner of the world. Du Bois exposes the meaning of being white. But what on earth is whiteness that one should so desire it? He asks in this searing chapter titled The Souls of White Folk. Play off, of course, the title of uh, Souls of Black Folk. He writes in response, then always somehow, some way, silently but clearly, I'm given to understand that whiteness is the ownership of the earth forever and ever, amen. Race, Du Bois makes painfully clear, is at the center of American life and an undeniable part of the identities of every American citizen. So what did this mean for the future of democracy? At a time when the United States is championed by President Woodrow Wilson, positioned itself as the exemplar of democracy on the world stage. Du Bois had an answer. Instead of standing as a great example of the success of democracy and the possibility of human brotherhood, America has taken her place as an awful example of its pitfalls and failures so far as black and brown and yellow peoples are concerned." End quote. Du Bois believed in democracy, believed deeply in democracy, the ideal of democracy. Democracy is a method of realizing the broadest measure of justice to all human beings, he wrote. But he also added, quote, a true and worthy ideal frees and uplifts people. A false ideal imprisons and lowers. The subjugation of women, class exploitation, a lack of investment in education, and above all else, the denial of the right of every citizen to engage in the voting process had to end. If America is ever to become a government built on the broadest justice to every citizen, Du Bois asserted, then every citizen must be enfranchised. Every citizen must be enfranchised. And every vote must count. Du Bois warned us. And now, here we are. In so many ways, Dark Water is the book of our moment. 100 years later, we are again grappling 
with the failures of democracy, the endurance of white supremacy, and the tension between hope and despair. Du Bois reminds us that these challenges are not new. The revisiting of Dark Water on the occasion of its centennial provides us with perspective on the nation's past, as well as inspiration for how we can go about confronting the uncertain days ahead and imagine a new future. Thanks. Doug Williams, that's absolutely fascinating. Um, can we? Can I go to uh, Amazon Books and find Dark Water tonight? Absolutely. Yeah, I think it's um, open access. Du Bois's books are pretty widely available, so I'm sure you can you can. No, pull I, but most of us, to be simple and confessional, I, I know the um, Souls of Black Folk, but not much more of Du Bois, except for his many uh, progeny at, at Harvard at the Du Bois Center and all that. So. I'm always proud that A, he was a child of Great Barrington, and B, uh, one of the prize students of my, my favorite American intellectual, William James. Uh, but uh, quickly, uh, so-called critical race theory uh, gets an unmercifully ignorant kicking around in, in the Trump era politics. But make a connection with uh, Du Bois and uh, this book. What is critical race theory, which is not so much about uh, black and brown folk as about us white folk, but the point that there is something fundamentally um, uh, destructive, invasive, uh, exploitive in, right. in the complexion itself. Yeah, I mean, du, du Bois was, was one of the, the earliest um, and still one of the most um, important theorists of, of race. He was remarkably interdisciplinary. Uh, he was a historian, as well as a sociologist, a uh, philosopher, a yep. political scientist, uh, a novelist, a, an essayist, um, and he brought all of those tools to bear on trying to understand uh, the meaning of race, uh, its endurance, um, but also race as um, an expression of, of both individual and collective identity. Uh, and in uh, dark water, and particularly in the chapter "The Souls of White Folk," he really pioneers uh, the uh, the study of whiteness, right? Uh, of understanding how white folk also have race, uh, and how their whiteness uh, informs their uh, the, their individual actions, but how uh, whiteness had also uh, informed uh, the the actions of nations, uh, and you know, rooting uh, this desire uh, for whiteness and white supremacy uh, more broadly in uh, the destruction uh, that had come out of uh, the First World War and that he was still grappling with uh, by 1920. Wow. I mean, can one imagine W.E.B. E. Du Bois confronting with seeing, envisioning uh, our president to this point? I mean, uh, it, it's <laughs> I'm sure he would have a lot to say. <laughs> no, no, this is terrific. And, and I will, I'm going to order Dark Water tonight. Thank you very much. And don't go away. Um, for our number three book. Susan Whistler has been running the Mount since 2007, and she has overseen the evolution of a mere mansion, shall we say, uh, Edith Wharton's house in the Berkshires, uh, into a historical museum that has now a cultural center for year-round artistic and literary programs. Uh, welcome, Susan Whistler, and let's hear it for Edith Wharton. And the age of innocence. Uh, thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here, um, albeit on somewhat short notice. Um, and so, um, but I uh, am very impressed with the competition this evening and with the eloquence of the advocates for the two other two other books. Um, so I am sitting actually in Edith Wharton's library, just to let you know, here at the Mount. And um, uh, I thought, sort of as a conversation breaker, I would share with you that we recently this year in the 100th centennial received Wharton's own copy of The Age of Innocence uh, with her signature. So it's a pleasure for me to share that with you tonight. Um, uh, so Wharton did win the Pulitzer Prize in 1921 for The Age of Innocence. She wrote it, um, uh, the war had just ended and she actually wrote it in just seven months. It's not the book that she wanted to write. She was still quite traumatized by um, the way um, 
the war had ravaged Europe and in particular France, and she was deep into a novel on uh, a, another war story. And um, the armistice hit and uh, her publisher said, you know what, the American audience is sick of war stories and they want another novel of manners. And so she'd already received the advance for the war story, but she quickly switched gears and within seven months actually came up with what is, I think, pretty widely regarded, regarded to be her, her greatest novel. Um, like Du Bois, she was very prolific, uh, over 40 books in 40 years, all different genres. I think she's best known for her fiction, but her first book actually was a well-known treatise on architecture and design that is still taught today. Um, she did win the Pulitzer for um, prize for fiction for the Age of Innocence. She was the first woman to receive that prize. Uh, she actually beat out um, is it Sinclair, Lewis? Sinclair Lewis for Main Street. And um, she was quite disgusted with the award, frankly. Um, the award was to have been given for um, the novel that best presents the wholesome atmosphere of American life, and in particular, the highest standards of American manners and manhood. And that was exactly what The Age of Innocence was not about. So what she was doing was actually shedding a very bold spotlight on the way that New York society, her society, uh, uh, imposed intense um, uh, rules and regulations that were intended to break the individual spirit and force people to conform uh, to the rules and regulations of that society. And um, basically it was about the tension between the collective will of society versus uh, individual freedom. And um, I think that's a universal theme. Uh, Wharton's books have been translated into languages all over the world, including, um, I have here a Korean uh, version. We can't really see it too well in the light, but this is a Korean Age of Innocence. It's been translated into Hebrew and Russian and Turkish, uh, Chinese, Japanese, uh, the list goes on and on. And so it, it does have universal appeal. And it does have, I think, as much relevance today as it did when she wrote it. Um, um, I, uh, and, from, uh, and, and it also is a very, very good read. And I think we can't forget that when we are judging um, uh, works 100 years after their time. And I just thought I would share with you, I mean, her, her writing is muscular and she packs dynamite into every single sentence. And I thought I would just share with you one sentence. And this is a description. And I, I'm assuming that most people are familiar with the, the plot of the novel, uh, in part because um, it's taught often in schools. And then there was, of course, Martin Scorsese's 1993 uh, adaptation to film, which, was, uh, which actually rocketed The Age of Innocence for a second time to number one on the charts. Uh, so it was number one back in 1920, uh, and it was number one again in 1993. And so this is a description of um, the great matriarch of the New York Society, Mrs. Manson Mingott, who uh, is the grandmother of Ellen, uh, Elena Lenska, who is the, the, the sort of exotic countess who arrives in New York City from uh, from Europe and basically is like a, uh, a wrench in the spokes of a bicycle and uh, throws everything into disarray because she's highly attractive and she's very sexy and sort of the chosen gentleman of this particular clan who has already been decided that he's to marry one particular woman is all of a sudden thrown off track by the arrival of Ellen. Uh, and this is um, her grandmother who's the great matriarch who at this point uh, when we are introduced to her, she's become so large and overweight that she can no longer make it up into her bedroom. And so she has broken, um, in, she says, in flagrant violation of all New York proprieties, she has made her reception rooms on the ground floor. And uh, this is one of my favorite sentences from the book. Uh, and it's describing Mrs. Manson Mingott the immense accretion of flesh which had descended on her in middle life like a flood of lava on a doomed city had changed her from a plump active little woman with a neatly turned foot and ankle 
into something as vast and august as a natural phenomenon. So uh, anyway, that's one of my favorites. And, um, and it's a book that you can read multiple times. And every time that you read it, you will get different things from it, which I think in many ways is the definition of a, of a classic. Uh, certainly Elif Batuman, who wrote um, a recent forward, uh, regards a classic that way. And, and depending on the age you are, you like, identify differently with different characters and it will mean different things to you. Um, uh, the first time you read it, you can read it as a sort of tragic love story. Um, the second time you read it, you can understand that the narrator uh, is told from a male perspective is in fact completely unreliable and actually quite foolish, even though it is through, um, through Newland Archer that you are getting firsthand sort of perspectives into the way New York society actually works. And then the last time that you read it, or the third or fourth time, you begin to understand how perceptive Wharton was and how sort of like with a surgeon's precision, she is telling you how white societies, in particular New York society, stay in power and how they crush those who uh, are trying to uh, advance and move up the social scale. And I think for that reason, uh, she does give us tools as we are now sort of at the point and brink of examining our own whiteness. And in that way, it can be very informative. And I, um, and, uh, and for me, this is, um, this is sort of the peak of Wharton's canon. And for that reason, I'm glad that we're still celebrating it 100 years later. And um, just in closing my case, uh, I wanted to just share a few of the sort of accolades, recent accolades from contemporary authors who also feel very strongly that The Age of Innocence is a, remains a deeply important work. Uh, and, the, and the list of authors is pretty, pretty broad. Um, Roxanne Gay, for example, calls The Age of Innocence her number one go-to book. Roxana Robinson describes being absolutely mesmerized by the book when she first read it as a, as a young college student. And John Updike, who didn't particularly like Wharton, uh, was awed by this book's perfection, what he called its perfection and its power. Um, Ta-Nehisi Coates hails it as um, awesome, and then goes on to say in an article that he wrote for The Atlantic that, um, uh, let me just find it, um, was that it uh, was more related to understanding slavery than he could convey. But I think it all has to do with the fact that you have a system that works to oppress and it works to perpetuate itself. Um, and then of course, uh, there's um, Elif Batman who um, recently observed that the novel feels more current and relevant now than when she first read it in 1993. And I will close with that. And I'm delighted again to be here. Uh, thank Susan, you. Susan Whistler, that's very powerful. For some reason, in my own mind, The House of Mirth, a story about a, the trials of a very beautiful woman, um, eclipses Age of Innocence. Reintroduce the characters very quickly. Who, who, who what, what? Okay, so the, the uh, yeah, so the main characters are Newland Archer, who comes from a very well-bred New York society family. Yes. And the families have decided that he shall marry a young woman by the name of May Welland, also a, a good family. And Ellen Lewenska is a distant cousin who has, who has been raised in Europe, was married to a count who did all kinds of, though it's sort of off screen or off page, all kinds of horrible things to Ellen Lewenska and she's decided to leave him and seek a divorce. And divorce is still quite scandalous. And so Newland is engaged, he's a young lawyer, to convince Ellen Olenska for the sake of the family uh, reputation to not seek the divorce. And in the course of that, they fall in love. Um, Newland tries to break his engagement, but he actually puts conformity uh, above everything. And so even though his desires rest with Ellen Olenska, he cannot force himself to, to break the engagement and then go against the clan. And then there's this wonderful sort of scene towards the end of the novel where the clan has all gathered for dinner and it's where they are making the final cut and 
of Ellen Olenska, and Ellen is being shipped back off to Europe where she spends the rest of her life. And then there's an epilogue. Anyway, that's sort of the broad brush, and maybe in, con in the questions we can flesh out the, the plot a little more. Yeah, no, that, that's just terrific. But um, obviously, this is not a, a, a novel of manners. It's something much deeper psychologically and philosophically. If perchance her eye had fallen on the chapter in the Du Bois book about the souls of white folk, um, do we know whether she ever, ever met, you know, confronted the work or met the work of Du Bois? But what would she have wanted to add to that conversation about some, some deep disguised drives in, in white folk? Well, um, because I'm such a latecomer to this discussion, I'm actually have, have been allowed to have my colleague in the room with me. So, Anne, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Um, I, sorry. Okay. So I'll, they have had a conversation. Is what I'm wondering. Yeah, they. Could Du Bois and Wharton have had a conversation, so to speak? I, I think. I think no. I, I'm not the Wharton of 1920, but I think um, were Wharton alive today. I would think that conversation in Du Bois were alive today, I, I would like to think that that conversation would have been possible because I think they both understood how oppressive systems work and that really would have been a very interesting conversation. But no, I do not believe it could have taken place in 1920. Yeah. Let's let take a crack at that too. But first, uh, those are three extraordinarily gripping cases for three interesting books. Don't go away anybody, but it's time for uh, Kathleen Pendleton of the Library Associates to join us on the screen and read questions from our audience. If indeed the audience has questions, Kathleen. Yes, we have uh, some excellent questions. Um, one is actually for you, Alan. Had you read uh, this book when you wrote Mr. G and did it color the way you treated whether Mr. G should refrain from acting on the feelings he had? Uh, no, I had not read the book at that time. Uh, I'm embarrassed to say. Um, I, I did know about the book, but I had not read it. So I don't know whether that's a, that's not a very satisfying answer, but, but there it is. Did you, did you meet the Chapek test, do you think? Do I meet, meet the Chapek test for what? I, I don't know, for an original observation on, on your Mr. G. Oh. Uh, well, Mr. G is a, is, is God, is God, and God, uh, in, in my book, Mr. G, which is a novel, uh, God is, is uh, he is all knowing, but not all powerful. And he, He's a humble being, and he decides that he's he's he uh, after he creates planets and stars and 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 humans and people on on other planets. Uh, he decides that he should not intervene uh, because he would he would startle them too much. Hmm. So uh, I don't want to take up any more airtime. Well, that, that, that's good. Over to you, Kathleen Pendleton. Excellent. Um, so this is a question for uh, all the champions. Uh, did where the books were written influence their authors? I believe that Capic is indelibly associated with Prague while Wharton was living as an expatriate in Paris and Du Bois had been in Paris at the time of the peace conference. I guess I'll, I'll start. Uh, Darkwater, as I mentioned, was uh, really written um, or, or compiled, revised over a, a two-year period. Uh, it's a, a collection of original pieces as well as previously uh, published pieces, uh, excerpts from editorials Du Bois had written in The Crisis, the magazine that he edited, the journal he edited for the NAACP. So he was in multiple places as he was kind of devising uh, dark water. Uh, he was in New York. Uh, he was um, also uh, in Paris, uh, in France. 
uh, as you, you mentioned, he, he traveled to, uh, to France uh, after uh, the armistice, uh, where he organized the Pan-African Congress, among other activities. Uh, so the book really reflects um, the kind of totality of his activities uh, during this, this two-year period, uh, as well as uh, his location, both um, globally, um, as well as uh, domestically. Well, I can I can jump in briefly about Karel Chopik. Um, I don't think that uh, Chopik could have written that book or would have wanted to write that book had he been, say, living in New Jersey or anywhere in the United States. Um, he was he was living in in Eastern Europe, and he was his life was very much shaped by the war. And of course, both World War I and World War II, uh, a lot of the battles were, were fought in, in Europe. And I think that, that the Europeans just have a much more visceral, immediate sense of, of warfare than we do uh, in the United States. So I think that, that being in Czechoslovakia, which of course is the center of both wars, um, had a, a big impact on him. Um, and I guess I would say it definitely her being in France had a, a big impact. Again, um, she it was 19 and the, the, the time. So the war had happened. She chooses not to write. She's been out of the country for oh almost two decades. And she's writing about uh, 1870s New York. And um, whereas the House of Mirth, which Christopher had mentioned, is I would say almost a sort of one note scathing attack on society and the way society can crush individuals. Um, in the Age of Innocence, it's much more nuanced and she's actually trying to make some sense of it and, um, and figure out if there is in fact anything redeeming about collective systems. Um, and so, and I think that the fact that she had been out of, the, out of that world for 20 years gave her um, a more distanced and I would say discerning uh, and less emotional eye. Um, it also, uh, it, it, the distance being in France imposed incredible technical difficulties in terms of the writing because she was writing the manuscript, sending it to Paris to be typed, then it had to travel across the Atlantic uh, to be printed and then the proofs had to come back. And so it, it, uh, it greatly complicated um, the writing of the book. Yeah. Thank you. Kathleen. Um, another question for all three of you. The 1918 flu pandemic lasted over two years. How did that play into the social context in which all these writers were writing and their outlook? Great question. Um, Chad Reeves, for starters, I mean, uh, did, did Du Bois leave a record of um, uh, himself and the and the flu, Spanish flu. No, surprisingly, Du Bois doesn't uh, really talk about the the, the flu pandemic um, that much. Uh, but I mean, he was certainly aware of it, and particularly in uh, relation to his experiences uh, with African American soldiers uh, during the war. Uh, he championed uh, the enlistment of African American soldiers uh, in the military. Uh, he travels to France after. Uh, the war uh, where he meets directly with black soldiers and officers, he tours uh, the battlefield. So he, he got a very intimate sense um, of the experiences of, of black servicemen domestically as well as um, overseas uh, and was, was certainly very aware of the, uh, the physical um, costs of war, but also the emotional and psychological costs uh, of war as well. Um, and that's a very prominent theme in, in Darkwater, um, how he's really wrestling with uh, the legacies of the war, his own personal involvement, investment uh, in the war, um, and it's uh, you know, really, really bloody aftermath, uh, how many African-American soldiers, after they come back uh, from, uh, from serving in the military, have to confront 
uh, the most kind of virulent forms of, of American uh, racism. Uh, so this kind of theme of, of death, right, in all of its different manifestations, you know, whether it's through the flu on, on the battlefield, um, in uh, cities like Chicago and Washington, D.C., where race riots were erupting, um, how African Americans really grappled with these very powerful questions of hope and despair, uh, life and death. Um, the, the possibilities of, uh, of democracy in America. You know, um, we associate um, uh, Franklin Roosevelt and World War II, among other things, with and the Cold War, uh, sort of prompting the American government to sort of clean up its act on lynching laws and then eventually the civil rights movement. What was the impact in World War I time and then in the 20s of that experience that you're speaking about and uh, a feeling of uh, we're coming home to uh, 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 another war in the States at home. Well, the boys write, say, a very famous editorial in the May 1919 issue of the crisis called uh, Returning Soldiers, uh, where he declares, uh, we return, we return from fighting, we return fighting. Um, so this idea that the war um, had not ended for African Americans, uh, that the war, at least on the battlefields of France, had been fought, but now African Americans were going to engage in a more protracted battle uh, for their, their rights at home. Uh, so World War I and the World War I era more broadly was really a, a foundational moment for the, um, uh, for the civil rights movement, uh, for what we can think of as a long civil rights movement, uh, the expansion of the NAACP, but also the emergence of a host of uh, different uh, key figures, um, key leaders uh, who would really serve as the, the foundation uh, for uh, the modern civil rights movement, laying the, the, the path uh, for activists uh, in the World War II era and beyond. Interesting. Interesting. One more question, Kathleen? Yep, we have time for one more. So was the um, are you our book the first to imagine re a real artificial intelligence? Uh, probably not. Uh, uh, I'm not sure about that. Um, uh, H.G. Wells, as I mentioned in his Island of Dr. Moreau, which I think was 1896, that his creatures were were uh, certainly artificial and they were intelligent. Uh, but I, I'm going to guess that, that there was some, there's, there was some uh, science fiction even before that that imagined artificial intelligence. I just am not sure exactly what it was. Can I just say, it's fascinating how these, these themes um, keep crossing. Uh, I'm just barely begun in a fascinating book from an MIT artificial intelligence guy, uh, a, rather, a dissenting PhD in the realm of artificial intelligence. And uh, it's called Artificial Whiteness. And it's about uh, uh, the, the latest trick in the, um, in, in the, white, <laughs> the white folk book is artificial intelligence. And as an ex as a, it's all constructed, the, the author Yadane Katz argues, with a kind of white, uh, against a white sort of uh, matrix or design. So there we go. It, 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 what goes around comes around and it all comes back to um, what? Whiteness, blackness, race theory, um, visions of society. It's right. been totally fascinating for me. I, I, I hate to stop it, I think we're, up against the deadline. Kathleen, and maybe Peter will, will lead us out. Oh, <clears throat> Kathleen, we, we have a vote, don't we? Oh, we do, of course, of course, of course. Yeah. That, that, that's Kathleen. Kathleen is the uh, vote counter. She's the Pennsylvania of the Boston Public Library. Oh, don't, don't tell me that. <laughs> yes, we're going to, um, a um, survey is going to pop up on all of your screens to vote for what the uh, best book was. And we'll take some time to tabulate the votes, not as long as the election. And we'll let you know the winner shortly. Does anybody want to warn us against voting fraud here or stuff <laughs> ballots or mail-in ballots or anything like that? 
So are we allowed to vote as well, or do we have to abstain? Does our vote count? Oh, everyone's vote counts. <laughs> okay, good. good. Everyone good. votes. <laughs> Every vote Yay. should count. All right. At the polling place. Love it. Thank you. I'm going to mail mine in. <laughs> I just saw him in County. While we're tabulating the votes, I wonder if I could ask a, a question. Um, and the question concerns a, a dark water. Um, so, um, uh, Chad, I'd be curious um, was it widely read? Um, in the year or the years following its publication? And what was the critical um, reaction um, at the time? Yeah, great question. Uh, so it was actually very widely read. It was uh, Du Bois' uh, fastest selling book, as a, as a matter of fact, at, at the time. Uh, I believe it went into a second print. Um, it maybe just uh, you know, a month after the initial uh, publication. Uh, so it was, was very uh, popular uh, at the time. It was reviewed quite extensively, uh, both in the United States as well as uh, in Europe. And the reactions to it, perhaps not surprisingly, kind of fell along, along racial lines. Uh, so uh, African-Americans, um, ranging from the black intelligentsia to ordinary, you know, working folk in the North, as well as in, in the South, uh, you know, janitors in New York, sharecroppers in, in the Deep South, uh, were uh, kind of euphoric uh, about the book, um, were, uh, were deeply moved by it. Du Bois really tapped into the, the zeitgeist of, um, of the post-war period uh, for African-Americans. He certainly had some African-American um, uh, radicals uh, who were um, critical of it, um, who were kind of skeptical of, of Du Bois's uh, kind of bourgeois uh, politics, uh, that he wasn't taking kind of class seriously enough. Uh, but for the most part, uh, most African Americans were uh, were effusive in their their praise. Um, most uh, white uh, critics um, thought it was a um, a, a deeply problematic book, that, that Du Bois was angry, that he was bitter, uh, that it was a dangerous book. Of course, this is in the context of uh, the post-war uh, Red Scare, fears of Bolshevism. Uh, du Bois was advocating for, for revolution. Um, this uh, kind of paranoia <laughs> uh, surrounding it, really reflective of uh, the mood of the, of the post-war period. Uh, as well. Uh, so, so many white critics uh, felt that uh, Du Bois's um, bitterness uh, was um, kind of a, a detriment to the books compared to uh, kind of the, uh, the tone of Souls of Black Folk, uh, for, for example. Um, but he was pleased with the responses. He didn't really care too much about what his white critics thought. So, <laughs> so I think we have a winner. Uh, drum roll, please. And the winner is uh, Darkwater, Voices from Within the Veil. Congratulations. Congratulations. All right. Du Bois would be very happy. <laughs> and I encourage everyone to, to read it. It's, a, it's really a, a remarkable book and, and definitely very timely right now. Well, I, I think that's uh, my cue then to uh, jump back in um, and to thank everybody um, for participating. So um, we congratulate um, um, Dark Water and, and, uh, and you, Chad. Um, uh, in a way, it's sad that um, we have to uh, declare a winner in this particular election, although we certainly do <laughs> in the other election that's going on because the, the presentations by uh, Alan Lightman and Susan Whistler were also wonderful. And uh, the Associates is very grateful uh, to all of our presenters uh, from the bottom of our heart. Thank you so much. Chris Lydon, um, what a joy it is to have you uh, again. And thank you ever so much. Um, you're a hero of ours and uh, we're, we're very grateful. Um, if 
folks in the audience um, would like to learn a little bit more about the Associates of the Boston Public Library, I certainly encourage you um, to, uh, to reach out. Uh, you can check out our website, which is associatesbpl.org. And um, I hope uh, next year when we get together, all of you will join us and we can join together in person um, and we can enjoy wine and cheese and other lovely things and perhaps at the beautiful Abbey Room uh, at the Boston Public Library, which is one of the most beautiful spots um, on the planet. So um, unless anyone else um, has any um, further thoughts, um, I will wish everyone well and encourage you all to drive carefully on your way home. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. <laughs>